Hello uh, everyone, welcome to the FAO Chat Live. I'm Hazel Burton and I will be your host for today's episode on thriving with cybersecurity as a small and mid-sized business, the 2021 Security Outcomes Study. Now, before we get started, I just want to say that we are live and we would love to take your questions at the end of this chat. So just post your question in the comments if you're watching on our website, if you're watching on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook. If you're watching on Twitter, there's just an extra step. Just use the hashtag Cisco chat in your tweet. Now, today's chat is all about what makes a successful cybersecurity strategy in a small and mid-sized organization. So is there evidence that security investments result in measurable outcomes? How do we know what actually works and what doesn't? and what practices are actually worth investing in. So to help me answer those questions, I have some brilliant people to join me in this conversation. Uh, first of all, we have Wolfgang Gerlich, Advisory CISO for Cisco Duo Security, a passionate advocate for SMBs and helping them to put their best front forward with cybersecurity, and he is a mentor to many. So welcome, Wolf, how are you doing today? Hey, Zoe, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for including me with this uh, conversation. As you say, uh, definitely small business coming from my roots and working with a lot of small business CISOs is, is a passion of mine. Making sure we know what to do is always something that everyone asks, what do I do next? And for so long without data, it's, well, maybe have you thought this other thing. This study is so exciting because it really does tie those outcomes to those behaviors. So great to be here with you today. Fantastic. Uh, secondly, it is my pleasure to welcome Omar Zarabi, president of Port 53, one of our very valued partners. Now, Omar has worked with thousands of small businesses across the world and has a really great understanding of, you know, some of the challenges that a resource restraint IT team might be facing. So thank you so much for joining us today, Omar. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Hazel. Thank you for having me. Like you mentioned, having worked with thousands of SMB organizations and having grown up in a small business myself, um, I'm very passionate about uh, helping SMBs stay ahead of uh, the most advanced uh, cyber threats. So very much so looking forward to today's conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Small business is where I started as well. So uh, really, really passionate about this. Um, thirdly, it is a complete honor to welcome Tazine Khan. Now, Taz is the founder of Cyber Collective, a community-centered organization that helps people understand the ways that data and privacy impact them, and they empower people to really understand their data privacy rights. Uh, Cyber Collective is also the first and only women of color owned data ethics, privacy and cybersecurity research organization. Um, so it's fantastic to see you again, Taz. How are you? It is such an honor to be here. I'm doing well um, and just super excited to listen and learn during this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Mike Storm, a distinguished cybersecurity engineer, host of Cisco's Unhackable podcast, and presenter of our cybersecurity makeover series. I just wobbled my computer there. Apologies. <laughs> How are you, Mike? Mike, I think you're muted. Could you unmute? There we go. How's that? There we go. Yes, uh, it's good to be here, Hazel. Thanks again for having me. Uh, as you know, uh, the small business is an area that uh, I'm very passionate about. We do quite a lot of, of things that are targeted specifically at the small business, you know, with the IT makeover series, you know, being able to go and show small businesses how they can succeed in this world of, you know, ultra complexity and, and cyber attack. And, and, you know, it's just it's really rewarding to see this pay off. So happy to be here talking with the audience and uh, looking forward to some of the questions. Fantastic. Now, as uh, Wolf mentioned, we're going to be chatting about some of the major findings of our new report out today. It's called Thriving as a Small or Mid-Sized Business with a Strong Cybersecurity Strategy. Uh, we're going to be talking about that very, very shortly, but I have two very important pieces of news before we get to that. The first is that we are giving away some Cisco Secure swag. So 20 participants will be randomly selected to win a Cisco Secure throw blanket and a Yeti mug. 
expertly modeled by our social media managers very friendly dog uh, so if you go onto our social channels you'll see exactly what i mean and what you could win uh, dog not included sadly um but this is uh to so say this is a competition it's open to uh, us residents only i'm afraid but if that is you please go to cs.co slash Cisco Secure Giveaway. We'll pop that URL up on, uh, on the channel that you're listening on. Um, make sure you do that by the end of this chat. So if you're watching us on demand, please don't enter. And I'll let you know when we're about to close the form. Uh, do make sure that you enter a real address so um, we can mail your prize to you if you win. And many apologies to any Cisco employees watching, but sadly you are excluded uh, from this prize. My second piece of news is that we have been running some polls on social media over the last few weeks just to see what the public's opinion is on how successful the cybersecurity strategy might be within various sized organizations. So we asked, what size organization do you think are the most successful in running a security program that keeps up with the rest of the business? So on LinkedIn, People told us that they thought enterprise was the most successful, taking 35% of the vote. Uh, coming in at second was small uh, with 29%. The third place was medium with 23%. And the last was large with 12% of the vote. Now, in this chat, we're going to be talking about security for both small and medium and the various challenges that they might face and how they might navigate through those. So it's interesting that those combined, small and medium, they got 52% of the vote, just nudging the, com the combination of large and enterprise. But on Twitter, our poll was a little bit more divided. So 61% uh, of people on Twitter said that they thought small or medium sized organizations have the most successful security strategy that is able to keep up with the business. Very interesting. Which brings me onto my first question to Wolf. So the study that I mentioned Thriving as a small or mid-sized business with a strong cybersecurity strategy, the 2021 Security Outcomes Study. It's a data-driven report. Uh, it includes responses from over 850 small and mid-sized organizations. Double blind, which is important because they didn't know it was Cisco asking the questions. And you can download it for free now at cisco.com slash go slash security outcomes SMB. So in that study, we highlight a couple of things that small and mid-sized businesses do better than their larger counterparts. Wolf, were you able to uh, talk us through a couple of those things that they do better and add some context around why that might be? Certainly, and that is one of the favorite questions that I uh, want to think about when, uh, when I'm looking at these studies, right, is, is where are we winning? <laughs> As you said from your polls, people are like, oh, SMB can't keep up. You know, there's there's a lot of division between who you ask and how they think about this. But there are some clear areas where being smaller provides some great uh, advantages. And what we found when we asked folks, hey, what behaviors are you performing and what outcomes are you realizing? What we found is that these broke down into three broad categories. These small and medium businesses were better at enabling and keeping up with the business. Um, they were better at uh, managing risk. They reported being better at uh, operating efficiently. That last one probably makes sense because if you've been in a small business, you don't have much. You've got to make the most out of what you have. The other two are very fascinating to me because what I think we're seeing is that within an organization, when you're in security, it can be very difficult to figure out what level to talk about. And when you're in a smaller company, and it's a little more clear, right? If you're if you're in a fund company, you talk about the funds. If you're in a shipping company, you talk about the trucks. And you get in the habit of better understanding where the you know dollars are flowing, what moves the needles, and better talking about security within that context. Because it's not as if there's six levels up and you know an office and another building that you need to, to go to in another state uh, to have these conversations. It's getting on the WebEx in the morning or uh, in the in the olden days, walking down the hall and bumping into the boss who goes, oh, by the way, we have this concern. So I think what we're seeing in this data is a realization of the relationships that form on a, on a smaller scale and leveraging those relationships to drive security outcomes. All right. 
Fantastic. Um, Tassine, uh, working with small businesses as you do all the time, um, what would you th could you summarize uh, their key goals at the moment? What are they um, looking and striving to achieve? Um, I definitely work with a lot of small businesses, but I cannot speak on behalf of all of them, right? But I think that there are some elements and trends that we can see across the board. And a couple of things, right? The key goals are pretty obvious, increasing revenue, you know, uh, reducing their expenses, operationalizing, automating a lot of the operational tasks that exist within a business. Um, and, you know, at least in the work that as we at Cyber Collective and me personally try to work with small businesses, something to keep in mind, right, is that, yes, the business has the business functions, but small businesses are normally run by, you know, five to 10 people at most. So I think it's also important to consider the the goals as individuals, right, and, and personal goals that these people have within the business that they are accommodating or working in or building. Um, so I, I think that most small businesses are focused on the future and at the moment, just within the community that I'm a part of, right, being, um, you know, in the spaces of a lot of women owned businesses and uh, people of color owned businesses. I think everyone is just trying to navigate the space, gain accessibility as well um, and more access to equity, I would say, is yeah. the difference that I'm seeing for sure. Fantastic. Yeah. And I guess that brings us on to, um, you know, the question of focus and priorities because you can't do everything. Um, and that's something I want to ask uh, you, Mike, about, um, you know, when it comes uh, especially to security in small and mid-sized businesses, you know, how do you put together a successful strategy when you might not have the budget or resources to do everything that you would may maybe want to, you know, how would you advise SMBs focus their priorities? So real quick qualification by resources, do you mean like human capital expertise, um, that kind of thing? Is that what you're focused yeah. on? People, okay, yeah. well, I, you know, everybody has budget issues, right? I, I think the, you know, first and foremost, having a strategy is paramount. I mean, the lack of one is, uh, a, you know, a real problem. Uh, many times it's, it's important for small businesses to understand the impact of a security event, which really will hopefully drive them to prioritize. Uh, as an example, if you look in the report, the report calls out the difference between a $100 billion enterprise and a $100,000 mom and pop shop. And a security event for that size of, a, of an enterprise typically co costs them you know, less than a thousandth of a percent of their revenue. Whereas with a mom and pop shop, it could be up to 25% of their revenue. And when you think that the data that they store is very close to being the same kind of data that we see large enterprises, be it medical data or financial data, whatever it is, uh, there's also regulatory implications there that could increase that cost. And so I would say, um, you know, the lack of a strategy is a really, that's a big problem. Uh, prioritize and go after the elements that are going to be targeted first. And I would say that still today, email is the number one transport vector for threats and endpoints are the number one target. So if you can look at those two things as being, you know, the highest on your priority list, if that's all your budget allows, at least having a strategy to begin there and then maybe expand to more, uh, you know, network security capabilities and or, uh, you know, some of the more uh, uh, complex capabilities that we see a lot of the small businesses taking advantage of when their strategy is complete. Yeah, fantastic. And um, we're also going to be talking about with you um, a, a small and mid-sized uh, organization's place within the supply chain. So how to manage those partnerships that you've got with your suppliers um, for the benefit of security. So we'll come on to that uh, shortly. Uh, firstly, okay. Omar, I would uh, love to talk to you about. So the, the report talks about how you can instig instigate a security program or strategy uh, which responds well to changing business needs. You know, that is more relevant now than ever. And everybody's business has been affected in the last year or so. Um, it's important that security doesn't impede new lines of revenue. Um, and in some cases, security may actually provide competitive advantage or even be a net uh, revenue generator. Um, and if security is kind of seen as a cost center or like the, the department of no, that is a sign that it is struggling to meet that goal, you know, uh, really, really becoming part of the business and contributing to the bottom line. 
So Omar, I'd love to know, you know, how do you help your customers um, get the right security in place for, you know, scalable business growth? Definitely. And I think just bouncing back off of uh, what Mike uh, stated over there, it is really essential to actually implement a strategy to begin with. One thing we find is a lot of SMB organizations uh, tend to go about cybersecurity uh, in an ad hoc manner and really a reactive manner. You know, whenever an issue comes up or whenever they face a challenge or whenever, you know, a compliance regulation comes, then they quickly scramble to figure out, you know, the, the, the solution or the controls or the policies or processes to fill those gaps or meet those compliance regulations. So uh, really taking a step back first and understanding where your business is. And then from there, uh, you know, understanding what goals you want to achieve from a security standpoint is absolutely critical. And you know, the way we really help our organizations uh, or resource restrained organizations and, you know, uh, Mike uh, hit the nail on the head. Everyone has a budget restraints, but I think the challenge with SMB organizations around their resource restraints has to do with the lack of security personnel in the market space. I think there's something like 3 million cybersecurity jobs that are going unfilled right now. So these SMB organizations don't have the personnel. They don't even have the expertise in-house to be able to run these strategies and build these proactive models. So, um, you know, how do we really assist and, 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 and empower and enable an IT manager, IT director, IT generalist, or a lot of times even a COO or CEO to run this sort of enterprise level cybersecurity stack? Um, and, you know, what we believe is we, we, we got to lean on one, the, you know, whatever line of business they are and, and help them understand what risks they face first. Uh, from there, have the conversation with your executive team around, uh, you know, their, their risk appetite. Uh, you can't really aim to meet a level of risk, uh, uh, you know, maturity if you don't even know what that is first. So um, taking the conversation from cybersecurity away from the technical aspects when you're talking to your board members, when you're talking to your CEOs or your executive buyers, and really aligning it with more of, of what they care about, what their terminology is. You know, they don't talk about, you know, proactive big data driven technologies, they care more about, hey, what are my risks? How is this going to impact my bottom line? How is this going to you know, increase my revenue, decrease my costs? Or how is this going to make me uh, you know, be able to win more business or become more compliant in new markets and so on and so forth? Um, you know, having that conversation with your, with your executive team is absolutely essential. So saying, hey, here's where our risk is today. And then from there, coming up with the roadmap of what level of maturity do we want to be and what level of risk are we okay with as an organization from there, then taking the necessary steps uh, to, to fill those gaps and get to that level of maturity um, is, is absolutely critical. And I think that's how you can really prioritize where to spend and, and, and what to implement. Um, like Mike said, uh, right now, the biggest thing that we see is, is, uh, the basic cyber hygiene, you know, if, from a cybersecurity strategy, if, if you don't have uh, the ability to assess your risk and, and come up with a, a level of risk maturity you want to get to, you have to at least take the basic cyber hygiene steps. Um, you know, I, I think of it as like the Pareto principle, right? The 80-20 rule. Uh, what 20% of, of tools can you implement that, you know, drastically or, you know, take care of the 80% of the risk your organization faces? And a lot of that has to do, like Mike said again, you know, around the endpoints, uh, around email, uh, around identity, so MFA and, and, and you know, SSO or uh, identity and access management tools. Um, and then the connection right now, more than ever, it's absolutely critical to protect the connection and have visibility to where your users, where your employees are connecting from and where they're going to. So, you know, protecting at the connection level, you know, at the DNS level is just as important as protecting on the endpoint level uh, today more than ever. So understanding that basic cyber hygiene and then from there, uh, you know, understanding what risks your organization is facing today and what level of risk maturity you want to get to. Um, is I think the best way to approach uh, you know a cybersecurity strategy if you don't have that in-house personnel. Yeah, I uh, I love what you were saying um, earlier as well about it kind of becoming a. Uh, uh, the language of the business. I was speaking to someone recently who said that um, growing up with a technical background, the language was bits and bytes. And suddenly, as a security leader, they need to talk talk in ones and zeros to you know align with the uh, the real needs, the you know, the financial needs of the business. So it's about adapting your language to make sure that the business goals and the security goals are the same. So yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Omar. Great points. Um, so just a quick Hazel? reminder. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go do, ahead do, do you mind if I, I wanted to add something to Omar's awesome response to because I think it's it's worth noting that, you know, in every business, there's always the human factor. Right. So, you know, this is something that not everybody considers the education of users in cybersecurity. 
uh, is a direct representation to how much risk you experience because that's the that's the one thing that there is no you know system control for. I mean, the, the education is huge. And when I, or in your uh, question, you had talked about the Department of No. And remember that security reduces convenience. Users want to get things done. They're relentless. They'll find a way around it if it exists. And so the best thing you can do is instead of saying no, like Omar was calling out, having that strategy, which also includes education of your users and making sure that they understand how to do things correctly instead of just not doing them at all. And I think that really helps to reduce the risk. And, and quite honestly, the avoidance of security events can lead to a lot more budget to uh, to execute on that plan. So <laughs> great. Thank you, Mike. Um, just a reminder that we are taking your questions. I've seen quite a few come in already. Thank you for those. Um, so just post your question into the comments of the channel that you're uh, watching us on. If you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag Cisco chat and we'll be able to see it. Um, Wolf, I want to come to you next. Um, and it's an area I want to focus on because it came up as quite a big differentiator between SMBs and larger organizations, and that is prompt disaster uh, recovery capabilities. And the data shows that's where SMBs are um, not quite as good as their larger counterparts in, ter in terms of um, you know, prompt disaster recovery. So what would be you know, your best advice for how SMBs can best plan for resilience? So when we think about good security, good security deters the adversary without deterring the workforce. To get to that point, we really need to get into the head of the workforce, what the people in the organization are doing to get the work done. What's fascinating is business continuity can be overlooked, right? The, the continuity and recovery, hey, things are running. We need to get uh, DNS controls in place. We need to get our MFA in place. Things are okay. We'll, we'll come back to that continuity recovery in a little while. Don't worry about it. One of the winning strategies, though, that I see time and time again with security leaders and security teams is using resilience to build the business case because resilience starts with saying, we have all this technology. What does it mean to the business, right? What is this piece of equipment and that person doing to enable our organization to meet its goals and to enable it to, to you know, reach towards that strategic intent? And from there, let's do an impact analysis. To Omar's point about dollars and cents, how much money would we lose if the service was unavailable or this person couldn't, couldn't contribute? So I think the, the uh, application of continuity recovery can drive a significant number of downstream security outcomes. As a matter of fact, one of the, the upcoming talks I have is at uh, RSA conference. So at the RSA conference next month, I'm going to be talking just about this, right? How do you build the business case? And then how do you uh, apply resilience? And there's a number of things that we find in the study that comes out of that. Better buy-in, um, the better ability to manage risk for data, the better ability to have efficient and appropriate security controls, quicker response plans. So when we think about security, it's oftentimes let's go tackle this one tool. But I would encourage everyone in the audience to think as well from a continuity and recovery lens. What does all this mean before we start building our strategy to protect it? Fantastic. Thank you, Wolf. Um, Omar, I want to ask um, you about the impact of the pandemic. I know it's very, very close to your heart. Um, so in the report, we asked um, participants about COVID-19 and how it has impacted their organizations over the past year. Um, the companies that were most successful in minimizing the impact um, on their operations and also their, their cyber risk, they had um, the following characteristics. There's three of them. They had a, pro uh, sorry, a proactive tech refresh strategy, uh, which emphasized uh, frequent upgrades to best of breed IT and security technologies. They had adequate security staffing levels, so people, and um, they invested uh, through role-based training programs. Um, and thirdly, they also kept uh, those top executives uh, really closely informed. Uh, they had clear reporting on the activities and the effectiveness of the security program. So bearing those three things in mind, um, Omar, do you think that the pandemic will change the way that SMBs approach security from now on? Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know, the pandemic changed the way that a lot of the SMB organizations looked at technology as a whole, right? And uh, you know, beforehand, you know, a lot of times, 
uh, these resource restrained uh, IT teams didn't really leverage, uh, you know, technology as in a competitive, uh, you know, to give themselves a competitive advantage. They just really looked at it to just get work done, right? And sure, there were a lot of companies who were looking at technology to be a business enabler. And those were the companies that had invested in digital transformation prior to the pandemic. And, you know, those companies, when the pandemic hit, were able to continue business as is, you know, like uh, seemingly overnight. Uh, but the companies that hadn't and, and who were very much so, you know, looking at technology as, uh, you know, something that uh, could be a hindrance or could get in the way of, of their organization, those organizations really looked at uh, security in, in that sort of castle and moat manner where all their employees would have to come into the office. They had their firewalls around that, you know, and, and uh, you know, as soon as they left, they would have to VPN back in, even if they could connect at all when they were outside of the, the office per, in the perimeter. Uh, but I think the digital transformation from uh, the IT team all the way to the executive team, um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the adoption of digital transformation um, sped up drastically. I think there was a stat that said that, you know, there's 10 years of technology adoption that happened in a matter of a week or, or so. So um, the fact that uh, yeah. organizations and executives and SMBs realize that technology not only can give me a competitive advantage, but I actually need technology just to keep my business afloat, just to keep business as is. Um, in turn, you know, made a lot of organizations and a lot of executives realize that, wow, we really need to look at securing that technology. And, you know, it, it definitely helps, uh, you know, when, when uh, you know, they, they're seeing it on the news and they're hearing about it on a day in and day out basis uh, through their channels. You know, there's a massive increase in cyber attacks during the pandemic, and we've seen it all in the news, um, and I'm sure executives have as well. So because of the fact that the pandemic is causing organizations to adopt technologies just to continue business as is, I think in turn is going to lead to a lot of them really having to take a deeper look in that technology stack and understand what they need to do above and beyond just that firewall and that endpoints protection to truly stay ahead of the bad actors who are you know, leveraging new tools, leveraging new methods and, and new technologies to uh, really you know, target this new way of work, which is outside of the castle and outside of the moat. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and Taz, um, and this is kind of a follow up to my first question to you about, you know, the most important things to SMBs. Um, bearing in mind the year that we've had and uh, for many of us, we're, we're still very much in it. What do you see as the main security uh, focus areas for SMBs over the next year? I would say, um, you know, one of the largest, at least in my purview within the peer circles that I run in are around privacy and the consumer data protection compliance. I think that the way that we treat um, consumer data is definitely being regulated in different ways that we haven't seen before outside of CCPA. But I know Virginia just passed a bill, Florida did, and things are being expedited exponentially. So definitely looking into all of the privacy regulations that exist and how that um, you know, is congruent to security is something I want to mention. A lot of people think that privacy and security are the same, but they're completely different. And I'm sure everybody here could agree that you can be very, very private and not secure, and you can be very secure and not private, or at least protecting consumer data properly. Um, something else that I think is on the rise, the way that we've seen access, connectivity, people working from home, right? Deep fake technology, um, deep fake voice, deep fake videos, and how that is leveraged to continue uh, with phishing attacks, right? And um, as uh, Mike had mentioned, email being one of the you know main ways that folks are uh, pushing through attacks and you know to get to endpoints. I think that will stand the same, and the social engineering attacks are getting to be continuing to be extremely sophisticated. Um, and then lastly, I think that's something, a, a, a main security focus, I know that I talked about some threats and compliance, but a main security focus that folks will probably, I think, look into, at least from what I'm saying, is um, being more on the offense versus on the defense with security, right? You're seeing a lot of tools and products come out with like, uh, attack IQ and a lot of kind of simulated attack tools that are testing your network and whatnot. And I think it's positioning a lot of organizations to be able to look at, okay, well, how do we defend ourselves with perhaps using bots to, you know, stop bot attacks from happening, which um, I find to be really interesting. And I'm, I'm curious to see how it's all going to pan out <laughs> next year and moving into the future. 
Yeah, me too. I've had a fantastic conversation on the Security Stories podcast. Uh, the new episode uh, that came out a couple of days ago is is with Taz, and we learn all about your your story um, and and you know how passionate you are about the issues that affect people with um, you know with, in terms of data privacy. So if uh, if our audience would like to hear more on that, uh, do check out the Security Stories podcast. We're on all of the podcast apps. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, Wolf, let's talk about one of your favourite topics, people. <laughs> um, so in this study, it's quite interesting that um, quite a few companies actually said that they didn't have dedicated security staff, but they still reported uh, successful approaches to security by having sufficient collaborative personnel. So it, it is possible. Um, and I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Do you have any um, do you have any advice for anyone who might be in a small business that might be balancing more than one role, security being one of them? You know, what, when is it time to buy a hat rack? <laughs> it's never too soon to buy a hat rack. And <laughs> by the way, I love that setup. Well, let's talk about one of your favorite things. People, I'm in. I'm, you got me. Let's go. Let's have a conversation. I have a lot of um, interactions with folks that I'm coaching and mentoring who are, you know, security leaders at smaller organizations. And this is, this is a real struggle, especially if you're in a small organization that's growing very quickly. So there are some strengths there. Uh, I don't have to convince my networking guy to implement the change if I'm the networking guy. <laughs> the meeting is like, Wolf, would you like to? Okay, it's done. Easy, right? It can be very easy for a small organization. However, the, the concerns is how do we scale and break these roles apart? So one of the things that I've been advising folks on is to look at some of the more formal frameworks. May seem like a little bit over, over engineering, but follow me through. If you think about your hat rack, what are each one of those hats? And those hats can be defined any number of ways. The NIST has a new uh, NICE framework. I'm not saying it's a nice framework. I'm saying the framework is called nice. And what it focuses in on is what are those security roles? What are the various hats that you're wearing? And I would encourage a small organization to use something like that. And here's the six roles I'm running. Today. I'm doing networking, I'm doing um, asset inventory, I'm doing identity. And oh, by the way, in six months, if we grow like we expect, I'm going to take one of those hats off. I'm going to move one of those roles off. And here's my plan to bring someone in and how I'm going to transition those things. So uh, I think the frameworks help, and I think having an eye towards stacking roles and taking them apart, stacking hats and taking them apart, is really the key to uh, to having an effective security team that scales from 1 to 100. Yep. Great point, and it's yeah, it's, it's important to, for people to know that they're they're not alone. You know, um, there are frameworks in place, as you say, that can help you make these decisions uh, and and support you. Um, well, stay around because I have a, a follow up question for you, also on people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for, for, so for mid-sized businesses, which obviously um, we also include in this study, um, there may well be uh, a team of people in place there. They, it, they may well be dedicated to security. Um, I would love to hear your advice about how they might want, how they might work with the rest of the business to ensure a strong security culture uh, so you, across the rest of the organization. So when we think about culture, culture is built one action at a time. Um, it's built one conversation at a time. It's built one ritual at a time. At the business level, if we're thinking about, uh, again, funds, I've talked about the funds, right? If we're thinking about that life cycle of business, we want to embed those conversations in that uh, process. If we're thinking about from development, we're talking one line of code at a time. We want to embed those conversational rituals within the development process. With IT, hey, one, one system, one configuration at a time. We want to embed again and have those conversations when things are happening. I think one of the strengths of being in a smaller business is it's easier to bring those folks together. It's easier to build those relationships and explain, hey, what you're doing is great and I want to enable you. I just need you to go a little bit left. <laughs> I just need you to do this one extra thing as part of that change. And in doing so, we're going to not only build up the culture through the conversation, but also the security posture through the configurations. Yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, Taz, as well, um, we had a fantastic conversation about 
how to cope with this feeling of being overwhelmed. And do you know what? This doesn't just apply for anyone in a security role, anyone who's been feeling like this uh, for however long. How do you how do you cope with feeling like it's just all getting a bit too much? Um, so I would love you to talk a bit about your advice. You know, for anyone who's feeling like they're on the treadmill, um, you know, reacting to things, as, as Omar was saying earlier, uh, what, what's your advice? Um, you know, I, I have some personal things that I probably shouldn't share here that I'm just getting around <laughs> advice of how to cope. But um, first and foremost, I would say, you know, just like um, Wolf mentioned around culture and people, I think that immediately considering the fact that um, nothing is as gargantuan in the moment of anxiety that we perhaps think that it is, and there's a solution for everything, or at least a way to be able to develop a solution. And I think that one of the um, elements of really not feeling overwhelmed, you know, there are two there are two sides to this question or answering this question. It's how do you cope with feeling overwhelmed in the moment or how do you prepare to not feel overwhelmed, right? So I think Wolf mentioned earlier, like business continuity plans, implementing, making sure that you have all of your kind of ducks in a row ahead of time and you're properly communicating it and learning how to communicate the way that security protocols have to be implemented within an organization and making sure that it aligns, as Omar mentioned earlier, with the larger part of the business. So I think that preparation really, really helps not feeling overwhelmed. But obviously with cybersecurity, you can't always be necessarily completely prepared, but you can have your defenses up and make sure that you are. So preparation would be the, the first element. Um, second, if you are in it, in the moment, if you are a threat analyst and you're just like looking at logs and you're constantly feeling overwhelmed because there's an unweary um, amount of attacks that are coming in, I think that communicating and asking for help is definitely extremely important in trying to get buy-in to other parts from other parts of the organization. Um, something I'm learning as I talk to different types of people and learn from these types of events and and conversations is that, you know, security is looked at like this redheaded stepchild at times, and it is seen as a cost and it's seen as kind of an after effect versus implementing security as a fundamental part of your business, right? Um, and understanding that it's it's a part of your business foundation and the risk as you build your business from a small business going into medium and then potentially wanting to be large or enterprise. So I, there's a lot of different thoughts that I have in my head. I don't want to ramble and I would love the feedback of anyone else <laughs> that has advice in these moments, especially from the perspective of a security engineer that pr probably has experiences before themselves. But definitely pr preparation is key and communication. Um, and deep breaths, <laughs> if you can afford yes. deep breaths in the moment that you're in. Yeah, no, I, it, it's it's amazing how much your breathing can actually help you. Uh, and I'm talking from a very personal perspective. Um, you know, I do suffer from panic attacks where I can't breathe. Um, and it's about getting your breathing right um, before you can do anything else. So, yeah, I think that's a really, really great point. Um, now, I'm just mindful of the time. I've got three questions left and I want to leave around 15 minutes or so for our audience because we have some cracking questions coming in. Uh, so if that's OK, um, any any more um, you know, advice that we have around um, you know, dealing with that feeling of being overwhelmed? Let's continue the, the, the conversation as well. We'll try and get as much advice uh, out there to you as, as possible. But just changing tack for a second, uh, Mike, I want to come to you now and talk about uh, supply chain security. So uh, it's been in the news uh, quite a lot in terms of some high profile breaches. Um, and it's really about, I guess, managing the security of your vendors and your suppliers. Um, it really helps to you know, contribute to avoiding major incidents for any size organization. And small and mid-sized businesses, as we know, they fill you know, they form the building blocks of uh, large supply chains and they're likely to be on the receiving end of cyber attacks for that reason. So, Mike, from your perspective, how can SMBs best evaluate the security of their key partners and their key suppliers? That is such a great question uh, and, and probably something that not everybody thinks about every day, right? You're thinking about your own security posture. 
which is which is good. I mean, obviously, you know, the number one thing you can do is have your own house in order. You have to make sure that your own strategy, your own security policy is intact. Uh, you know, that you're managing privacy, just like Taz had said, because that is, uh, you know, your your customer's data is paramount. Um, and, you know, at this at the same time, you know, many small businesses, this kind of technology is not really their core competency. And so it makes it that much more difficult to be able to evaluate partners. Now, how important is this? Well, if you look back, you know, traditionally, I mean, even probably one of the most uh, famous breaches that kind of got the whole dawn of the breach started was the target breach, right? Which was actually a breach through, uh, you know, their HVAC partner, uh, which, you know, kind of was a, for, a an initial indicator that this was really important. And as we've watched the, the statistics of breaches over the years, you know, the, the number of breaches that are actually um, uh, seen because of a partner that you're connected to are over 60%. Of, of the number of breaches seen yearly. And that's a big number. I mean, that's a lot to think about. So, you know, I my recommendation is always make sure you have your own house in order first. Um, leverage potentially, uh, a, you know, channel partners, partners that assist you with your technology to help you extend your security policy. There should always be risk assessment. There should be audits. There should be bare minimums uh, that should be, uh, you know, enforced, if you will, when a partner makes a connection. Because, your customer's data privacy uh, is, is paramount and an extension of trust to these partners means that you're extending that, you know, the trust of that data to them because they could potentially be the ones that cause that data to be lost. So it is a, an absolutely critical thing to think about. And again, if it's not your core competency, leverage your partners. Uh, Omar, you know, has a, a, a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, set of partners that he works with that probably do this very, very thing. But it does allow you to do that risk uh, qualification and, uh, you know, some of the security audits necessary to keep you safe. Yeah, as before, you don't have to do this alone. Uh, partners will help you to do this. Um, Wolf, um, I want to I want to ask you about this because I think it's great to dream big. You know, that's core to an SMB, um, being entrepreneurial and um, being scalable in your growth. And I'm sure many of the uh, SMBs watching will have that ambition and drive to become perhaps the enterprises of the future. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about measuring security performance through metrics, because according to the study, that's quite a big differentiator for large companies, which makes sense um, just in terms of how successful their security approach is. So what is your advice to SMBs um, on how they can best measure the impact of their security performance? When we when we started the conversation, one of the first questions you asked is where do SMBs tend to do a little bit better, right? And one of the things I surfaced was the hey, operational efficiency that we can we can do a lot more without much. Now, the, the good things about that is we're focusing in on the right security priorities. If we're focusing on enabling the, the workforce without enabling the criminal, um, we can we can really drive the security needle. The downside of that is, is if I'm doing a whole bunch of great work, I may not have the time or the resource or the hat to go forth and create a dashboard and start collecting data and everything. You know, the old saying when I was growing up was, uh, you know, Measure twice, cut once. That made sense because wood was expensive. Today, I would encourage the uh, small business that is not yet having good metrics to maybe cut twice, measure once. Start down the path of instrumenting some of these processes and measuring things such as uh, the the uh, efficacy of controls, which we can get off of a number of different things, phishing and everything else. I'm not going to go down that list, but the efficacy of controls. Also, too, uh, measuring where we may be creating some friction in the process and evaluating if that's the right place to push back to making sure that we have security that is actually enabling the business to do what the business is in business for. So when it comes to metrics, let's instrument things that are important. Let's not over-engineer it. Let's do it, take a sampling approach and then use those data driven points to better tune the security to what the business needs. Fantastic. Uh, now I have one more question of my own, and then I'm going to turn it over to the fantastic questions that have been coming in. Uh, so the last question uh, from me is for Omar, um, and it's a question of budget. 
So can you talk us through um, how you position the various financing options for SMBs, which really align to their, their cash flow realities and minimize their upfront costs? Definitely. I think uh, especially for SMB organizations, uh, cash flow truly is king, right? And uh, we want to make sure that they have the cash flow they need to uh, be able to not only protect the organization, but to run their organization as they'd like and ensure that they have you know, cash flow to make payroll even and so on and so forth. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the big shift that's happened in technology, which is that shift towards, you know, the cloud uh, is allowing us as vendors and as partners to deliver services and solutions, um, you know, in, in an elastic model, right? So uh, the, the, the power of the cloud, the beauty of, the, of cloud delivered solutions is that you as a small business don't have to go out and build that solution yourself, right? Uh, um, and, and that's how, you know, we're able to, for example, you know, deliver that enterprise grade security and protection, you know, like Cisco Umbrella, for example, being a cloud delivered solution that's used in five of the five Fortune 5 companies. Well, we're able to deliver that same level of security and protection to a you know, 10 person shop or 200 person company uh, because of that elasticity of, of that solution and the, because of the fact that we could deliver it, you know, per consumption. Uh, so really, you know, my first advice for SMB organizations is look for cloud delivered, hosted, uh, you know, big data driven solutions um, that, that that you don't have to go out and build out yourself. Um, and then um, from there, you know, when, when it comes to uh, finance, when it comes to cash flow, you know, because we are such a good, good partner with Cisco, we've partnered with Cisco Capital, um, as well as other financing arms to be able to deliver these solutions. You know, if you can't pay it up front, you know, you could do multi-year uh, deals and multi-year subscriptions that you can pay on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, on an annual basis to ensure that, you know, you're not bringing in watered down solutions because of budgets. So you are able to attain this enterprise level security and protection and bring in the resources that your organization truly needs to protect against, you know, like I mentioned today's most advanced and sophisticated attacks. Um, and, and you can do that without, uh, you know, breaking, you know, uh, your bank or, or having to worry about making payroll the next, uh, the, the next, uh, the next month. So, um, leverage cloud delivered cloud uh, uh, subscription -based oh. solutions. Um, and then from there, you know, work with a partner like us that can bring in the financing arm at, uh, you know, 0% interest and whatnot to be able to match, uh, you know, your cash flow and be able to consume that technology while paying for it, you know, on a monthly or, or annual basis. Yeah. I think I think that's really important. You know, some things that you think might be out of reach from budget perspective might not be. There, there is always a way. Um, so we're going to go over to our audience questions uh, now. Whilst you are putting in the last minute questions, um, you can download the report that we've been talking about today. It's called Threading as a Small and Mid-Sized Business. It's packed with great advice and some really interesting data. So head to cisco.com slash go slash security outcomes SMB. Um, and oh, as well, we're just about to close the form to win some free Cisco swag. So US residents head to cs.co slash Cisco Secure Gateway for a chance to win some fantastic prizes, but be very, very quick. Um, so I have got some fantastic questions uh, that have just come in. I think I'm going to put this first one to Wolf because it's about people. Um, and it's from Natalie on Cisco.com. What are your recommendations for smaller organizations that are struggling to find qualified applicants? You know, do you have any tips for navigating the security talent shortage? Oh, that's such a good question. So you're you're right. We've got a, a large degree of shortage in, in people right now. Um, it can be very difficult to get the top talent. Uh, I think one of the areas where SMBs can really shine is being a little bit more creative in terms of how we source that talent. I used to run an uh, apprenticeship and it was amazing to me. I would see an article one day saying we've got a million unfilled jobs. And the next day I'd be like, how many people did we interview? We were interviewing on average 50 people for every person we brought in. And so like there's 49 people out there who are you know, still ready to and willing to work in the field. I think uh, one of the areas that we need to build as a core competency is sourcing talent differently and upskilling those people very quickly. Now, what's fascinating in the last decade is we've seen there's a lot of tech resources out for training up and improving the talent uh, that uh, that we can attract. Great, thank you, Wolf. Uh, this next question I'm going to put to Mike, uh, and it is from Izili on Facebook. 
Uh, I am into home automation and also managing a small scale welding outfit. How can I use Cisco Secure to, sorry, so it's safe to secure my business from cyber attacks? So welding, um, that's, uh, you know, ho home automation is one thing. I mean, that's that's technology. So that's a little easier, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's something that you can certainly uh, put together. Um, a welding shop, I, I'm trying to trying to quantify what uh, what types of units would be protected there because I think it's mostly mechanical. But you know, I would assume that uh, you know following some pretty standard uh, practices is probably good in both instances. I mean, obviously, uh, you know what you have at the edge is a big deal. Um, you know, you know, as everyone knows, we we always have a device at the edge that is doing some kind of some kind of security. But there is a misconception in the industry that that's all you need. Remember that it you know, a lot of the attacks happen inside of your environment in, you know in and between your home automation systems in and between the employees of the welding shop they don't always see the traffic it's not always headed back to the internet so make sure that you are also covering the assets internally in your environment to make sure uh, that uh, that they have some uh, level of security posture that can can obviously give you some protection so you know again i i really look at uh, you know, I'm always addressing the human factor first. It's one of the reasons that we have the Unhackable podcast, for example, because it's it's all about people. And, you know, nobody can really be unhackable, but you can certainly execute practices that make you a harder target. And so that that human element is huge. And then also protecting, uh, you know, the endpoint is a really, really, you know, it, it's a quick and easy way uh, to, to knock out a majority of the attacks, because ultimately the endpoint is the target, right? It's whether it's a camera whether it's uh, you know a lock that someone's going to try to compromise, uh, or if it's uh, an actual PC or a phone, I mean those are ultimately our targets, and that's what we want to protect first as our first line of defense. Fantastic. Uh, we've also had a comment from a, a fan of yours, Mike. Um, uh, Cindy's watching from the website. Wants to know uh, if there are any more uh, security makeover series coming because she really enjoys watching those. There is, in fact, uh, we are. We actually have. Uh, uh, I believe the, the the next season is about to start filming. So we just finished the remote worker edition, which was fantastic. And we're about to do uh, to do the next season. And uh, we're really excited because this one is international. Uh, and so it's going to cover not only, you know, the, the makeover capabilities from a, a small single site location, but one that actually has locations around the world. So, you know, we're branching out a bit and pretty excited about the capabilities. I wish I could share more than that, but uh, uh, have her ping me offline and maybe we can talk about it. Yeah, it's a good trailer though. Oh, <laughs> nice. Um, Omar, I'm going to put this question to you because it's about um, the impact of, of COVID-19. Um, uh, Marie on Cisco.com um, says, we're noticing that some SMBs are unwilling to take risks. Um, they're not spending anything this year and they're, that, therefore they're keeping uh, outdated software and hardware. How would you change their views? Again, I think it really comes down to, uh, you know, talking the uh, the executive's language, right? And, and making them understand that, yeah, you know, you might be in a, in a business that is facing a lot of uh, uncertainty right now, but, uh, you know, the way you're going to get through that un uncertainty is by taking massive action, right? You can't just sit back and be a victim of the circumstances. You really have to, uh, you know, take the actions and make the moves necessary in order to keep your business afloat and in order to continue to give your business a competitive advantage. So, uh, with that in mind, I think, uh, you know, technology is by far the biggest enable. I think we all, you know, can agree on that during the pandemic to enable and help these small and mid-sized businesses uh, not only get through, uh, you know, the pandemic, but really, you know, give them an opportunity to come out stronger on the other end. So, if a small and mid-sized business executive is deciding not to spend money and not investing in technology right now, well, they'll quickly find that they're going to be in, in, you know, in a disadvantage once we come out of this pandemic, when all of their competitors and everyone else in the industry did, you know, uh, move to the cloud and, and, and adopt hosted technologies and did empower and enable their employees to, to be able to work, you know, from anywhere, anytime off any device. So, um, really under making your your executives, you know, your your business owners, your boards of these small businesses understand the value and the importance of taking action and, and taking the correct actions and, and, and where technology fits in those actions. Um, I think we can go a long way in, in getting them to understand that we, we have to invest in the business if we want to come out stronger on the other end. 
And then on the other uh, aspect of it, because like I mentioned, these are a lot of these are, you know, moving a lot of these technologies, a lot of these security controls are moving to the cloud, just really getting them to understand that it's not that heavy of a lift. You know, it's not like you have to go and, 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 and buy like your entire DVD stack. It's, you know, like you subscribing to Netflix. That's what a lot of these security solutions are like now. So um, getting them to understand that, hey, us attaining this enterprise level security posture that protects, you know, the technology that we're uh, uh, putting in to give ourselves a competitive advantage uh, is not a heavy lift. It's not going to, you know, cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars today. And, you know, we can, you know, pay it in a subscription based model where we're paying it annually or quarterly, uh, giving them the confidence to to invest in that, I think, uh, without, you know, like we mentioned, affecting cash flow during this uncertain, uncertain times is going to be critical. So, that's my biggest advice is with those business owners, those executives, don't talk about what the technology does. Don't talk about how you need to protect, you know, the, those laptops when they're off the network because they're not hitting the firewall. Don't talk about the importance of protecting at the DNS layer or protecting, you know, the identity with multi-factor authentication, especially with the changing threat landscape and the changing sorts of attacks. Talk to them around how technology is going to empower and enable them to come out stronger out of, after the pandemic and the importance of security uh, in doing so. And, and don't don't forget don't forget about the next level of the use case. I mean, exactly what you said, Omar, spot on. And I, you got to remember that people are returning to the office if they did go remote. And I think what you know a lot a lot of folks don't realize that you know we had a great opportunity to outsource our bandwidth because it was the bandwidth from the house the, the home, and we've moved our applications to the cloud, even though they might be resident on prem. They're being you know instantiated in the cloud. A lot of customers don't realize that when they bring the users back into the office, that all of a sudden the bandwidth itself is two to three times the requirement of what it was prior to the pandemic. So, you know, be ready to make that calculation and understand that that can be impacted as well. I, I think that's really important for, you know, kind of what's going to happen over the next six months. Definitely. Brilliant. I'm going to try and sneak in two more questions if I can. Uh, Wolf, uh, Deepak on. Um... You can to protect the organization from internal threats, so there's insider threats. I, I missed the front end of that question, though. I'm sorry. Uh, Deepak on YouTube, he asked, how can someone protect the organization from internal threats? Oh, yeah, great question. So um, thankfully, I mean, I don't have the concrete data on this, but thankfully the insider threat is a little bit lower for the SMB market, which is is good. But in general, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you've got good visibility into um, what the data is, who can access it, that you've got good controls over it. A lot of times as we're going really quickly, we may decide, oh, we'll just add access and let everyone in because we're all one big family. And that may work when it is still a family run business, when it gets to 40 and 400 and up to 1000, those models break down. So uh, when we're thinking about insider threat in the SMB space, I would look at good asset management and good data management. Definitely. Fantastic. Hazel, to bounce yeah, off I, of, uh, I, Yes, please I, do, Omar. Two, uh, two things, one for insider threats. Uh, in terms of controls, um, really kind of le uh, leveraging a zero trust architecture where, um, yeah. there, like the gang said, there is no uh, inherent trust given where an, or an, an, an individual, whether they're the you know, CEO, whether they're you know, just an you know, entry-level intern, if they have certain access, they have to authenticate and they have to prove their, uh, who they are at every turn. That's going to be very important. So really looking at a zero trust model. Um, and then the second thing is looking at behavioral analytics tools that really, you know, inside your network, look at users' behavior, builds a baseline, and then not notifies you or alerts you for any sort of anomalies against that behavior. So two easy uh, sort of approaches or architectures is zero trust if you're really afraid of internal, uh, you know, internal threats, and then uh, that, that sort of uh, behavioral analytics tools uh, that, that check for anomalies. And Omar, to your earlier point, and Hazel, I'll be real quick because I know you want to get one more in. To your earlier point about it doesn't need to be a whole bunch of stack of DVDs. It can be Netflix. It's it's amazing how much of what you just described can be done with dual security and a uh, zero trust approach in their trust monitor. Exactly. Yeah, fantastic. And I do you apologize if my internet is glitchy because my internet is streaming Netflix. So apologies if my internet is a little bit glitchy. But yes, I have one last question, and that is from David. Uh, who is watching us on cisco.com and these are his words not mine uh what is the biggest trend 
in cybersecurity for the little companies? And Mike, I'll ask you that first, but anyone else feel free to answer that one too. I, I think the biggest trend is beards. We, we see more and more security folks with beards. That's, I mean, everyone here has facial hair. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, I think the biggest security trend that I'm personally seeing is awareness, right? This is the thing that I think has changed drastically over the last three years. There was almost no awareness whatsoever of vulnerability at the small company level. And I think that through a lot of efforts of great people like on this panel and at Cisco and our partners, I think the, the awareness has really changed. And what that awareness leads to, that awareness leads to a desire that even if I don't have the expertise, I'm going to work with Cisco, Cisco partners or someone who does that will allow me to implement at least the bare minimum because I am vulnerable and my data does matter. The data that I have is just as important as the data in some of the largest companies in the world, and I've got to keep it protected. So, I, you know, I really think that that's the number one trend that I'm seeing is that there's more and more small businesses proactively going after having some kind of a, of a plan for this uh, to make sure that they don't become the victim of a cyber attack. Um, for anyone wondering why I haven't asked Taz some questions, Taz had to drop early for another engagement, but um, she and I had such a good conversation. There is so much that I personally learned from her on our podcast, which came out a couple of days ago. So if you just search for security stories on any podcast app, you'll find the uh, latest episode with Taz on there. So for anyone who'd like to learn more about her views on uh, data privacy um, and kind of uh, you know mental health, loads of stuff that we cover. Um, but that is, and I'm afraid, all we've got time for today. Um, thank you so much to Taz, to Wolf, to Mike and to Omar. Thank you to the Cisco TV team who do that, that, this fantastic work in the background. Thank you to you, our audience, for watching. Do remember to grab your free copy of the 2021 Security Outcomes Study and we hope to see you at another Cisco chat very, very soon. Have a great day. <laughs>